Welcome back to Faith on Film, where we raid your church library in search of the good stuff. And welcome to the next installment of Based on One Gospel Lent. In 1993, a small company known as Visual Bible International put out their first movie, a word-for-word -word adaptation of the Gospel of Matthew. Hey, there already was a word-for-word -word movie about St. Matthew. <laughs> He's a heathen. He doesn't count. All right. Anyway, this company produced two more movies, both complete adaptations of other New Testament texts, Acts and the Gospel of John. However, depending on whom you ask, John was made by either a completely different company that just happened to have the same name, or was the same company just after a change of management. I find the latter a little more plausible. The Gospel of Matthew stars Richard Kiley, who, if you're a Broadway buff, is known for starring in the original Man of La Macha. He's going to be our narrator, because just like in the Jesus film, the book's author is telling us the Gospel story. There's one key difference here, though. St. Matthew is a character we regularly see and interact with throughout the film. Kylie plays Matthew as a caring older man. While he's dictating his story, he'll play around with a child. There's even a nice creative choice in the reciting of Jesus' genealogy of all things, where Matthew treats it as a call and response to see how well the child remembers the names. Eliakim, the father of Azor. Azor? The father of Zadok. <laughs> I do like how creative this movie gets with the narrator. I like how sometimes he's dictating, but sometimes he's just remembering. It gives the movie a feeling of life that you need in a project like this. As we learned last time, simply having someone read an entire book of the Bible to you can be quite dull. But Kylie has personality here, ergo the movie has personality. There's also a surprising amount of interesting cinematography and editing going on. The first instance that I clocked was the Massacre of the Innocents keeps cutting back to Herod, who seems to feel no regret. I honestly compared this to the baptism sequence in The Godfather. Positively. set up and unlike last time the background characters and extras have direction so the movie has a lot more energy well not everyone has energy okay john the baptist is boring and forgettable he sounds like a bad liam neeson impression who warned you to flee from the coming wrath produce fruit in keeping with repentance they make an interesting creative choice with the disciples so the gospel of matthew has a lot of parables but rather than simply having Jesus tell all of the stories, he starts to encourage the apostles to help act them out. The only other time I've seen something like this is in God's uh, the Don't get ahead of Lent. Fine. Anyway, it was a pleasant surprise. Naturally, this was done the most with Peter. And he has a pretty easy chemistry with Jesus. Speaking of Jesus, though, we need to talk about Bruce Marciato. Starting with this movie... Bruce has played Jesus 15 times. You would think that means he's pretty good in the role, right? Mm, to be fair, this one was his first time. He doesn't get better. Oh. He likes to play up Jesus as a friendly, approachable, down-to-earth guy with a sense of humor. Nothing wrong with that. Except for the fact that Bruce can't portray any emotion other than sheer giddiness. It's not even like general happiness or serenity. It's just joking around. I think my favorite part is the added scene where Jesus and the disciples have a splash party. Seriously, I thought we weren't adding anything to the text. What gives? And lo, Jesus did dip his hand into the surface of the deep and raise his hand once more directing water upon the face of Simon Peter. And Peter saith unto his Lord, 
Oh, son of man, you got me wet. This especially bites Bruce in the butt. Whenever he needs to recite any of the harsher passages, he just can't stop smiling. Even his take on the seven woes is delivered kind of sad, but not really with the gravitas of, I am grieved that you have lost your way so much, but more, you interrupted my happy, happy fun time. This is how Bruce plays Jesus. I, uh, I hate to bring this up, but Matthew's Gospel has a lot of Jesus telling people off. It's kind of incredible to me that two different depictions of Jesus that are both word-for-word -word adaptations of the same Gospel can be this far apart from each other. Pasolini's Gospel according to St. Matthew, as you might recall, was the one with the angry Jesus. Visual Bible International is a jolly Jesus. How does this happen? It's simple, really. Pasolini read Jesus as a firebrand activist, and Visual Bible International wants to portray him as a safe, marketable savior. One of these things isn't like the other. What's funny is, sometimes this does work. When Bruce is doing the preaching and the storytelling, you can believe that all the passerbys would want to listen to him. He just can't turn it off, which completely undermines him when he has to get serious. Down to earth is not the same thing as beaming giddiness 24-7. In trying to make him more relatable as a human being, they inadvertently made him less complex than the character in the text. One way that the filmmakers try to work around this is by simply cutting back to Matthew dictating when they seem to think that Bruce can't carry a given scene. This only gets them so far, though. Given that this is a four-hour movie and Bruce has plenty of opportunities to stumble through a more biting scene. You guys do realize that just saying something mean with a goofy grin on your face doesn't make it less mean, right? Um, how would you say our Jolly Jesus handles Passion Week? He's... Uh, as we said, his seven woes are more like seven odd darns. Even when he's being crucified, I have trouble taking him seriously. It may just be that I've already heard this guy talk for three and a half hours, and I know he cannot do the more sorrowful or passionate parts justice. The other major gripe that I have with this movie is it is too long. I can appreciate the idea behind trying to get the entire book in here, but there's a reason that even Pasolini didn't try. Matthew the book can be very repetitive, something that you don't really think about until you start trying to watch a movie like this. If this movie were shorter, I'd like it better, but as it is, it does start to drag. For a point of comparison, three, three years later, a film using the entire text of Hamlet came out. It's about the same length as this movie, but it works significantly better. You want to know why? Why? Hamlet was written to be performed. The Gospel of Matthew was not. One is a play and one is a book. Books were not intended to be directly translated to film, not like this anyway. Where Pasolini didn't add anything to the text because he respected it, these folks didn't add or remove text because they viewed it as sacred, and that drastically impacts the difference in style. Maybe we should move on to Axe. Why? Well, it's the next movie. Okay, here's why that's dumb. The Acts of the, the Apostles is indeed a direct sequel to a gospel, but it sure as heck fire is it Matthew. Axe picks up motifs and ideas laid down in the Gospel of Luke, flattening the idea of the canonical Gospels to the point that you can just follow any of them up with Axe, defeats the entire purpose of them as separate texts. And it really raises the question why you would bother adapting them as their own movies in the first place. You want to know what's a really good indicator that Matthew and Axe don't jive well together? Matthew ends after all the disciples have gone up north to Galilee, 
from Jerusalem, and then Axe picks up with them still in Jerusalem, to say nothing of Judas's ultimate fate. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. With the reward he got for his wickedness, Judas bought a field. There he fell headlong, his body burst open, and all his intestines spilled out. Hey, Finn, are you getting textual criticism me again? It's a hobby. Well, knock it off. You know what? Let's just forget about this movie as being a sequel. Yes, Bruce is back, but that's really about it. None of the other cast is here, the costumes and sets are drastically different, so we really might as well be starting from square one. That's even worse! Well, here we are. Moving on. This movie is unfortunately all of the weak parts of Matthew, but none of its strengths. Our narrator is, of course, Luke, played here by Dean Jones. Which is, oddly enough, introduced by a completely different narrator? Okay, I can get behind this casting choice. Dean Jones did a one-man play called St. John in Exile, in which he described the entire experience of living as one of Jesus' disciples. And he did quite well. Too bad he's boring as a rock in this movie. Come on, man. I know you can do better. Where Kylie's Matthew has a sense of a life and a community surrounding him. All we ever see Jones do is tell his story. Okay, technically he does do some physician business, but it's not like it's exciting. It's mostly us watching him, watching his patient learn how to slowly walk again. We My old nemesis of lifeless extras has returned! Then there's the main story. Well, uh, the actor playing Peter is alright. I almost get a discount Sean Connery vibe from him. Unfortunately, nothing surrounding him supports his performance. Especially during long speeches like Stevens before the Sanhedrin. People just sit quietly and wait for the speaker to finish. They have no sense of an inner thought process or interacting with each other. They're just quietly existing. How is it that Animated Stories from the New Testament, a direct-to-video series of cartoons for children, did that scene better than this movie? And of course, Bruce still pops up. Oh boy. Boy! About that ascension scene, I don't know if it's physically possible to do an ascension scene in earnest that looks goofier than this one. It's like they slapped poor Bruce into chroma key, took a look at the rough draft of the scene, and declared it good enough. They couldn't even wait for a bigger cloud to appear in the sky, so Jesus just disappears into this wispy little thing. Guys, are you trying to be taken seriously or not? Because it sure looks like you're not! Honestly, Axe is so boring and unnatural, I couldn't even finish it. I petered off and around, I think it was chapter 19. How do you know what chapter it was? Oh, because both Matthew and Axe had a chapter and verse counter on the bottom of the screen, so the audience watching at home could literally keep track of where they were in the book at all times. Nevertheless, you are correct. I was only able to finish this movie because I put it into 1.75 times the speed. You know, I think Axe just isn't a book of the Bible that is going to work being translated to film this way. The Gospels are considerably dialogue-heavy books. You've got lines for Jesus, the disciples, the high priest, Pilate, day-to-day -day Israelites. Axe might have a bigger cast of characters, but there are considerably fewer speaking parts. There's also very little sense of the Holy Spirit, which is a weird thing I didn't think I'd ever have to say, but here we are. The apostles wind up scattering and going in different directions for the majority of the Book of Acts. But the unifying thread is that the Holy Spirit is guiding their actions. In fact, some scholars have gone so far as to say that the Holy Spirit really is the true protagonist of the book. 
but there's nothing to convey an underlying spiritual presence behind any of their actions besides Dean Jones's Luke dryly telling you that the spirit is involved. So what you're left with instead is just a bunch of disparate plot threads that have nothing to do with each other happening simultaneously until they just arbitrarily stop. Matthew I found surprisingly engaging. Axe, not so much. How does John do? John came out a full nine years after Axe. You can certainly tell with the camera quality. And the lack of a chapter and verse counter. And a new Jesus. And the shift to a pure voiceover narrator. And a decidedly different tone. <laughs> Point is, a lot of the style changed in between. <laughs> and it's pretty well for the better. Where Matthew is a watchable movie, John comes out as actually pretty good. And a lot of that does ride on the strength of Henry Ian Cusick as Jesus. You'd think he'd be in a Luke movie. That's the one where Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Sorry, sorry, had to get that out of my system. Desmond from Lost is our Jesus. He manages to strike a good balance between being approachable and charming and releasing the fury when it's called for. He's great at showing compassion to the people he encounters, but also has one of the most violent temple incidents I've ever seen on film. And they feel like cohesive parts of the same performance. Actually, there were a couple of times where Cusack would be smiling and I'd be thinking to myself, see, Bruce, this is how you do it. The director also understands that there's a certain isolation that comes with being in leadership, and this is worked into Cusack's performance. Another interesting choice made here is sometimes this movie consciously tries to look like a painting. This is something that can be very hard to pull off while still looking natural, but I think these guys do pretty well. They also do a pretty good job of visualizing things that weren't intended to be visualized. A good example is when Jesus first encounters Nathaniel, he said he re I saw you when you were under the fig tree before Philip called you. We are given no further elaboration on what this m indicates. But the movie shows us this in a brief flashback, having Nathaniel reverently reading from the Torah and implicitly feeling God's presence in the fig tree itself. That's a nifty little choice. And it works quite well, even if the green screen isn't so hot. Yeah, that happens a couple of times throughout this movie. Even simple things like the Jerusalem skyline at night look pretty fake. But there's enough good going on here that this is more of a nitpick. I really dig these apostles, though. For one, a lot of them carry themselves like working class people. But there's also a pretty close-knit group among them. The book mentions the Twelve, but it never lists all of them by name, so you only have a small handful who have any role at all. Like Philip. You know, this just goes to show how rarely John's gospel gets adapted. Nine times out of ten, it's Philip barely registers as an extra. There's also a nice build-up over time. When Jesus goes to the temple, which is much, much earlier in John than it is in the synoptics, he still only has five disciples. It's not until chapter six that he really gets 12 of them. This is also our introduction to Judas. Ooh, I like this Judas. Or rather, I like to hate him. The Gospel of John is easily the one that paints Judas as the most villainous. And this actor does an exceptional job of capturing him as a pure, unadulterated douchebag with just a look. We don't even need the narrator to tell us he has intentions on stealing the money. It's written all over his face and in his delivery. Why wasn't this perfume sold? For 300 silver coins. And the money given to the poor. It kind of makes you wonder why nobody suspected he would be the traitor. Huh. I wonder if it's the obviously evil guy in the group. So one of the Gospel of John's most iconic scenes is Jesus revealing himself to Mary Magdalene on Easter morning. But John doesn't really give Mary and Jesus any scenes before this part. So the movie works around this by adding her as a more prominent extra all throughout the movie. They're implying the prostitute backstory again, but so much here because it's a good visual shorthand to make her stand out. And because she stands out, the scene in the garden carries the weight that it needs. Mary Magdalene is also present at the Last Supper. 
There were just 12 disciples and our Lord at the Last Supper. The Bible clearly says so. Um, actually... Don't you um actually, Monty Python. We gonna fight. What I meant was, the Gospel of John doesn't explicitly say that it was just Jesus and the apostles in the upper room. So, an adaptation of John can include Magdalene in the upper room. Overall, John is the artsiest movie of the three, with flashbacks and occasional changes in the color palette. You can tell that these guys were trying to be faithful to the text while also making it visually interesting. And the flash forwards. All right. Some of these make sense, such as showing Peter as an old man awaiting his own crucifixion while Jesus is predicting that that's the kind of death Peter will experience. Fair enough. But there's one that makes me raise an eyebrow? While Jesus is talking to his disciples en route to Gethsemane, he says, The ruler of this world has already been judged. As he says this, we're shown Pilate for the first time in the whole movie? Um, it sure sounds like he's talking about Satan. This is especially strange because John is pretty Rome friendly. Jesus even pointedly tells Pilate that You have authority over me. Only because it was given to you by God. The fact that this gospel would want to emphasize being on good terms with Rome makes sense, as it was written during a time when Christianity was, was distancing itself from Judaism, which was largely seen as a bad light in the empire. There's even text about it at the beginning of the movie, so we know that you know this! If you'd wanted to emphasize Christianity as overcoming Rome, you should have done that in a Mark movie. Come to think of it, why hasn't there been a Mark movie? An excellent question. It's the shortest of the canonical Gospels, so you wouldn't have to worry about it overstaying its welcome like Matthew did. By 2003, we'd had three Matthew movies, a Luke movie, an Acts movie, Jesus contextualized, recontextualized, decontextualized, deconstructed, paraphrased, played as larger than life, depoliticized, seen from other people's perspectives, historicized, and even made into a schlocky action hero. So why couldn't we get a straightforward Mark movie? After that time of trouble, the sun will grow dark. The moon will no longer shine. The stars will fall from heaven. Then the Son of Man will appear. Coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Uh, Nathan? Don't say something disappointing. Um, this never went through. They lost their budget. No! You were so close! And if the narrator from that trailer sounded familiar, by the way, that's because it's Christopher Plummer. He's our off-screen narrator in the Gospel of John, and it turns out I can listen to Christopher Plummer read a dictionary. He's quite a natural fit for a job like this. That said, there is also a two-hour cut of John, which is improved by cutting out most of the narrator. It's not that I dislike Plummer. Heck, in John, they actually make a step in the right direction by cutting out most of the parts where the narrator says... He said, after a character speaks, allowing it to flow much more naturally. But, at the end of the day, this is a visual medium. And you don't need a narrator telling us things that we can already see are happening because it's redundant. He went back into the palace, then asked Jesus, Where do you come from? Let's get into ratings, then. I'm going to give Matthew a passable. If there was a more well-rounded Jesus, or even if they had just trimmed it down a little bit in editing, it would approach a good movie. But as it is, it is not bad. Axe, unfortunately, gets a don't bother. The lack of energy and creativity is just too damning of the entire film. In that way, it's a fitting companion piece to the Jesus film, just worse. Yeah, that wasn't a compliment. As for John... I'm gonna give it a good enough. It's easily the best of this concept that I've seen so far, but what's more is it's actually a competent movie. 
The two hour cut of John is also good enough, just a little higher up the scale in my estimation. If there are going to be any more word for word adaptations, they should emulate this movie's style. Good thing there weren't any more of these. Uh, Nathan? I said there weren't any more, Stephanie. Right then. Thank you for joining us for Faith on Film. I'm Stephanie. And I'm Nathan. I'll see you next time. You know what would be kind of funny? What's that? If you did a Jesus movie where you have the temple incident in John, which is earlier, and then you get to Holy Week, and the guys in the temple, Oh, not again! <laughs> no, not again! <laughs>